بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات عمالنا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم أما بعد I just want to make two points Ikhwani, about the lecture from yesterday and inshallah in the upcoming Khutbat al Jumah and the one after that we're going to continue to deal with this issue about the Basharia of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam because of the serious need that the community members have in regards to understanding this issue. Our masjid is a masjid where all of the Muslims are welcome. We strive to be on the minhaj al-salafi and the way of al hadith that a masjid of Hizbiyah where people are not welcome. All of the Muslims are welcomed here. And as a result of that, alhamdulillah, we get quite a large number of people who are just from the Ammat and Nas, new reverts, people from different madahibs, people from different persuasions in the deen. And as a result of that, we have to always take into consideration the needs of the community. Ala kullin, we mentioned this issue about the istiwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yesterday. And one of our brothers, Ammar al-Nasih al-Ameen, insha'Allah, al-Shami, jazahullah khaira, he came to me and he made a tanbih. And there are different faces that I see in the audience of people who they come during the class or after the class, they'll say, the ayat goes this way, the hadith goes that way. You said that we worship Rasulullah, but you meant to say we worship Allah. And this is something that we love, where the Muslim gives us advice. As the great scholar of Islam said, Al Imam Abdullah bin Mubarak, he said, May Allah have mercy upon the individual who gives to me as a gift my mistakes. He gives me advice. Because we're speaking about the deen of Allah, and one of the last things that we want to do is to misrepresent Allah's deen. So in our deen, we shouldn't speak about, we shouldn't delve into, we shouldn't deal with issues we have no knowledge about. Because the hearing, the sight, the heart, what you think, your niyyah, these things, all of them, you're going to be questioned about them. So we don't want to misrepresent Allah's which is deen. No one is perfect and no one is a scholar. So when a brother is sitting in the audience, and he see, hears something that is clearly incorrect because of a slip of the tongue or the hadith is weak or the ayat wasn't recited correctly or whatever the mistake may be, then it's your duty and your responsibility to rectify the situation. I told you a number of times, a number of occasions. You have the green light to do that. You have the green light to do that. And I'm bari, I'm bari of the individual, free of the individual who hears the thing being said and it was wrong and they didn't say anything and they just were shy or for whatever reason they didn't give me the gift. They didn't give me the gift. So Allah has commanded cooperate with each other in righteousness, in fear of Allah. We have to cooperate with one another. Al Mu'min Mir'atul Mu'min. The believer is a mirror to his brother. If his brother sits in the audience and he yarns like this, his Muslim brother brings it to his attention that he should put his hand over his mouth or he should try to keep his mouth closed and don't open up his mouth like that so that shaitan doesn't laugh at him. So the deen is nasiha, nasiha. The brother mentioned yesterday that during the course of the talk when we mentioned the statement of Al-Imam Malik, I don't know if you brothers caught on to it, but he was the only one who came up to me we mentioned the famous statement of Al-Imam Malik 
in which the man said to him, Ya Aba Abdullah, O oh, Abu Abdullah, Allah says in the Quran, Ar Rahman al Al Arsh is stawa. Allah is over his throne. He rolls above his throne. And then the man said, How did Allah rise above the throne? Al Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala became severely upset and angry with that question to the point that sweat started to come down off of his brow to show how serious that question was and how disturbed he was that someone would ask such a question. And then he gave the principle that we spoke about. And the principle is that he said, an istiwa, the rising of Allah, that characteristic, al istiwa khayru majhul. It is not unknown. It is ma'loom, ma'roof. We know what it means. And he said, the way that Allah did it is not known. That's what we don't know, how Allah rose. And to believe in it is wajib, because it's in the Quran and the Sunnah. And to ask about it is an innovation. And he didn't stop there. He said, get this man out of my majlis. Now, the first point that we want to make, inshallah ta'ala, is that next week and the following of the week, the few classes that we're going to have on Sunday, we're going to deal with this particular principle that came from the kalam of al-Imam Malik because of what it entails from the importance of al-Aqidah and the benefit of it. Second point that we want to mention is the brother informed me that during the course of the muhadara yesterday I said that the man came to al-Imam Malik and said how does Allah descend? How is the nazul of Allah? And then I went on to say that al-Imam Malik said that the nazul, this word coming down, is known. How Allah did it is unknown. To believe in it is wajib. And to ask about it is an innovation. Then we went on to explain that we take this principle and we apply it to all of the sifat of Allah, all of his characteristics, any and every characteristic. The hearts of the slaves are between the two fingers of Ar-Rahman. He changes them how he wants to change them. He'll make a person Muslim, and then he'll change him into a kafir. A person is a kafir, Allah will change him into a Muslim. A person is shakir, grateful, happy, and he shows Allah his shukr by praying and doing all kinds of things. And then Allah changes his heart, and he becomes a person who's not shakir. Allah Ta'ala, he changes the hearts of the people. So this hadith about the fingers, the two fingers of Allah, two fingers, those fingers are from his characteristics. We take that principle and we apply it. The fingers in the Arabic language are known. How Allah's fingers are, we don't know. To believe in them is wajib. To ask questions about it is an innovation. And every characteristic of the Quran and the Sunnah, you take that point. So anyway, I just wanted to rectify and to clarify in public and keeping with the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam Kullu Bani Adam Khattaun Wa Khayru Khattain Tawabun All of Adam's children they make mistakes and the best of them who make mistakes are those who they make toba, they repent so we want to come to clarify that issue because we have some people from our community some people, this is the nature of the people they are what's known as Mutarabbus they lie and wait for a mistake. And everyone who is sitting here makes mistakes. And if you wanted to sit to investigate and to catch people, to go fishing for their mistakes, you can do that for everyone here. But the way the brotherhood of Al-Islam is and the justice of Al-Islam is that when your brother makes a mistake, there are certain things you have to do. You have to give him a thousand excuses, especially if the mistake is muhtamil. He says something and it can mean this or it can mean that. It's your job and responsibility to take his statement on the best possible meaning. But when there is hatred and enmity between you and a person, his statement can mean this or that. The people who hate you and there's hatred between the Muslims, he'll carry your statement on the worst possible meaning. And that's not fair. That's a sign of hawa. The, the, the desires are involved in the equation. So if we were to deal with people like that, why is it easy for me to come to clarify this issue? Because I know every human being makes mistakes. Every human being makes mistakes. And Imam al-Bukhari 
is the Amirul Mu'mineen in the Hadith and the authentic Hadith that we mention in our Masjid over and over again. The 70,000 people who enter into the Jannah without any adab and without any hisab. Ismail, who are those four people, those four groups, 70 grand, will enter into the Jannah without any adab and any hisab. If you can't get it, then the next man. He doesn't ask people to perform ruqya on him. He has tawakkul on Allah. He doesn't have superstition. One more, and you're the man. And he doesn't burn himself with cauterization. That hadith is inside Bukhari and Muslim. And Imam Bukhari, he made the word in the wrong way. Ismail said, the one who doesn't ask people to do ruqya. That's the correct way of putting it. And Imam Bukhari said, and brought in his book, the one who doesn't, the one who, the one who makes ruqya. And that wasn't what the hadith said. So the point is, Al-Bukhari is the Amir al in hadith. So if he can make a mistake like that, do we turn around and say, and Bukhari doesn't know what he's talking about? No, this is the nature of Bani Adam. It's the nature of Bani Adam. So no one should feel any hesitation in correcting himself when he made a mistake, especially about the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the correct statement of Al-Imam Malik was about Al-Istiwa. Al-Istiwa. Now concerning this issue, Lekhwani, the statement of Al-Imam Malik, it is a tremendously important principle in Aqidah. And that's why we're going to study it for the next few classes, bi ta'ala. And as it was said by the people of the past, that the kalam of the Salaf, the people of the past, they had a little kalam and a lot of barakah. Qalil al-kalam kathirul barakah. They used to say a few things, but it carried a lot of blessings, a lot of barakah. Whereas the people today, there's a lot of kalam and there's qalil al-barakah. This is how the people were of the past. Starting off with the companions and then with the tabi'een after them and with many of the people from the atba'at tabi'een. We don't say all of the people from the atba'at tabi'een because after the third generation, that's when a lot of the innovations started to take foot, to grab hold, and there was a lot of kalam of innovation. But in the first two generations, especially the first 200 years, little kalam and a lot of barakah. And that came because the companions took directly from the one, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the companion Jabir ibn Samra, Jabir ibn Samra, radiyallahu anhu. Qala kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kathir al-sumt, qaleel al-dahak. The Prophet used to spend long times of being quiet. He didn't talk a lot. He spent extended periods of time keeping his mouth shut, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he used to laugh a little. He spent long times of being quiet, remaining silent, and he used to laugh a little, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wasallam. Obviously, that has a meaning to it. Although Allah mentioned his one of his main functions, as Allah mentioned in the Quran, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرِ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِلَ إِلَيْهِمْ We send down to you, Ya Muhammad, this dhikr, this Quran, and it's your job to explain what all of these ayat mean. It's your job to explain what the arkan of al-Islam are, the arkan of al-Iman. It's your job to explain everything about this religion so that when you die, Nothing is left except that it's explained. Although that was one of his main functions, he used to spend long periods of time being quiet. But when he opened his mouth, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, there was barakah and fa'idah. And that's from the sunnah. And that's something we have to struggle to be upon. That's part of the akhlaq of the Muslim. That when you open your mouth, the things that you have to say are going to be beneficial. As for him laughing a little, that doesn't mean that he never laughed. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He used to laugh at things that would happen. He had a wonderful sense of humor. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. But he didn't go overboard. So the point here is, although one of his main functions and responsibilities from his wadha'if and nabawiyah was to explain the message, he didn't talk very much. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. But when he talked, there was a lot of barakah. The khutbah al 
was very short and the Salat of Al Juma was very long. The Khutbah was short and the Salat was long. Today the Khutbah, the Kalam has to be long, has to be long and prolonged so that the people can understand. And the Salat has to be short because if you make the Salat long and the Khutbah short, people won't understand and also they'll find it strange. From his Sunnah for the Khutbah al Jumah is that he will get on the minbar and read Surah Qaf, Qaf, and then he will pray. If you do that today, in most of the masajid, this will be a fitna for the Muslims. They'll wonder, what are you doing? What's going on? Because the actual Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, has become unknown to many of the people. So the best speech is the speech of the Prophet, وسلم, the best speech is the speech of Allah. And the best guidance is the guidance of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, So I wanted to bring this issue to your attention as the first point To remind you and to remind myself To be of those people who when you talk have something to say Give advice, the dhikr of Allah Reminding people um, and Saying nice things, whatever it happens to be Because as we all know Inshallah the lisan is one of the two things that people are going to be punished the most as a result of it. The tongue. People are going to be punished more than anything else because of what they said with their tongue. So we want to rectify that issue. Second issue that we want to rectify, or not rectify, but bring to your attention is because of the time there was some ishtiba, some ishkal. What time was Salat al-Isha? So when I asked the brother how much more time he thought it was almost close to the time of Salat al-Isha, so we stopped kind of abruptly, but then the Q&A session went on for about 15, 20 minutes, and we could have utilized that time to touch upon one of the really important misconceptions about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the religion of Allah, and that is something that was connected to what we spoke about. Allah ta'ala being everywhere, being everywhere, and his ability to see and his, and his ability to hear but not being everywhere that he is here sallallahu subhanahu wa ta'ala but he is above his throne as we mentioned the issue that was connected to that and it is an issue a mas'ala that is prevalent in our community is the issue of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam being hazir ha, hazir nazir or hadir nazir that the prophet is omnipotent that the prophet is everywhere that he's here with us right now. Hashirillah. And he's in Kashmir, Azad Kashmir right now. And that he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is in Tunis right now. And I can't think you get the picture. He's in Mugudishu right now. And he's in New York City right now. Everywhere. He's on the moon right now. He's in his grave. He's in Mecca right now. Any and everywhere. And this comes as a result of Ghulu. And as I mentioned, the majority of the Muslims in this city, from our brothers, from the Brailwees, of the opinion that this is the religion. The Prophet is everywhere, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this is not established. This is attributing to him a characteristic that is solely for Allah. Allah Ta'ala is the one who is with everyone. He is with you wherever you happen to be. He's with you because he sees you, he hears, he knows your situation. He is muhitum bi kulli shi. He is surrounding every single thing. So as a slave, we can't afford to allow Allah to miss us where we're supposed to be. We can't afford to allow Allah to catch us or to find us where we're not supposed to be. So we're supposed to be places like in the masjid. We're supposed to be in the masjid for Salat al Jummah. You have to make sure that you're found at the time of a Jummah in the masjid. And that Allah, that you don't go missing at that time. So don't allow Allah to find you in a place where you're not supposed to be. And don't allow Allah Azza wa to miss you in a place. Meaning you're not where you're supposed to be because actually Allah, you can't escape. You can't escape his knowledge. You can't get out of his mulk, his kingdom and his dominion. So we're going to deal with this in further detail, inshallah, in the next two or three khutb, bi'idhnillah. The bashariya of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so that more people can hear the message, and also the fact that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is not everywhere. And there are many delils for that, 
I just want to share with you one today, in Surat Ali Imran. In the story of Maryam, Salawatullahi wa salamu, Salawatullahi wa salamu alayha, Allah Ta'ala mentioned something of a lot of her story. And the point is that the ayah said, ذَلِكَ مِنْ أَنْبَاءِ الْغَيْبَ نُوحِيهِ إِلَيْكِ وَمَا كُنْتَ لَدَيْهِمْ إِذْ يُلْقُونَ أَقْلَامُهُمْ أَيُّهُمْ يَكْفَلُ مَرْيَمْ وَمَا كُنْتَ لَدَيْهِمْ إِذْ يَخْتَصِمُ After Allah told the Prophet وسلم, about much of her story and the story of Zakaria and Yahya, things that the people wouldn't have known about had it not been revealed in the Quran because the Bible, the Torah, the Injil have been tampered with, you can't rely on it anymore. Allah told us the details of how Maryam was born and what happened with her mother. And then he told us also about, again, Zakaria and Yahya. The ayah said, Ya Muhammad, that is from the news of the unseen that we have revealed to you. And you were not there, Muhammad. You were not there when the people, Zakaria and the other people from Bani Israel, you were not present, Ya Muhammad, when they drew lots amongst themselves to determine which one of them is going to give the tarbiyah for Maryam. She was from the awliya of Allah. Every time Zakaria came into her private chamber, her mihrab, not this mihrab, but the place in the house where the person prays. This mihrab is an innovation. Mihrab in the masjid is from Christianity. We borrow it from them. Not this mihrab, we build a masjid, we buy a place, we have to put a mihrab. It's not from the way of Ahlul Hadith. Anyway, every time Zakaria would go into the place where she was staying in the house, he would find with her sustenance, risk. He said to her, Ya Maryam, where did you get this food from? She said, it's from Allah. Allah provides for whoever he wants to provide for without any hisab, just give it to you, whatever he wants to give to you. So they said that Maryam in the winter time, she had fruit that only grow in the summertime. In the summertime, she had fruit that would only grow in the winter time because she was from the awliya of Allah, which is a clear indication and proof Al Islam doesn't put women down. Al Islam is not multicultural, against multiculturalism. Al Islam is not oppressive. Maryam is from Bani Israel, she's from Bani Israel, but she raised, she's raised in our religion. Her khal, Zakaria, was the brother of her mother, as the Muslim historians say. The Mu'arrikhun and the Mufassirun, they said that Zakaria was married to Maryam's auntie, her khala. So she was from the awliya of Allah, from Bani Israel, and yet Al-Islam raised her. Ala kulli hal, the point here is that if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam was everywhere at all times and he was created first in the nur, from the nur of Allah and he has something to do with everything he's always been around why would Allah Ta'ala in the Quran tell him you weren't there when they drew lots they drew lots to determine who would take care of her nor were you there when they were arguing amongst themselves as if it's two incidents at least in one ayah you weren't there when they drew the lots and then it came out for Zakaria nor were you there, Muhammad, when they were arguing amongst themselves. So what? Allah Ta'ala, is he Hazar Nazar? He's not Hazar Nazar. Then they'll come and they'll say, well, he's Hazar Nazar for everything other than this time. But we're going to show, inshallah, there are other ayat and other ahadith and other incidents that clearly indicate he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was not, is not, has never been, will never be Hazar Nazar, omnipotent nor was or is any other human being. As for the question that was put forth about the ulama of the Brailwis, and I'm not here to do any Brailwi bashing, but it's the reality. From the ulama of the Brailwis is the man Tahir Qadri. He's like the most knowledgeable one from amongst them. You ask anyone from the Ammat al-Nas, he's like the most knowledgeable one from amongst them. 
we will find in issues like this and other than this issue, there's a consistent pattern, systemic pattern of taking ayats out of context. If the hadith is authentic, it's taken out of context. The Prophet is from the nur of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, where's the delil for that? The delil for that is a fabricated hadith. We don't work with that. Okay, the delil from that is an authentic hadith. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ma bayna bayti wa minbar Ma bayna bayti wa minbari rawdatun min riyadul jannah the place that is between my member and my house is a garden from the gardens of Al Jannah. So if you pray in the road of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wasallam by the Lord of the Kaaba, you have prayed in one of the Jannahs in the Jannah. We have to believe that. Now Muslims may not believe that, but as a Muslim, if you want to be a mu'min or a muhsin as a Muslim, you have to believe that because he said that. Sal Bukhari, Sahih Muslim. So when you go to Medina, it is from the religion to go to that place and to pray in the member. There's no virtues in praying behind his grave. If you can avoid praying behind his grave, avoid it. Get on the side of his grave. There's no virtues in that. So being a person of Tawheed, try to avoid not praying directly in front of leaving his grave in front of him. Although you're near is not praying towards him but just to close the door of a shirk to close the door that doesn't mean we don't love him we love him sallallahu alaihi wasallam we love his message his message of tawheed his message of connecting our hearts with the one who created us and sent him showing us how to worship allah so we can't get it twisted allah is the ma'bud and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the one that we follow but we don't worship him he's a human being Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Anyway, that's an authentic hadith. That shows that the Prophet is created from the nur of Allah. Now if I were to ask you brothers, Ya Akhi Zaki al Sudani, from the Ard of a Sudan al Habiba, Ya Zaki, what is the connection between this hadith and Rasulullah being created from the nur of Allah? He's not going to be able to come up with that interpretation because it's not ma'qul. It's not reasonable. It doesn't make no sense. The only way you can do is with takalluf, like this man makes consistently. So what's the interpretation from the authentic hadith? The interpretation is, if between his house and his member is a rawda from the riyadh of al-jannah, then jannah is nur. And Jibril came and took dirt from this area, and since his house is there and his member is there, he is created from the nur of Allah. That's the interpretation. Now when you hear that, you look at that and you say, nah, you really telling the truth. Wallahi, I'm telling the truth. But the other people, when they hear that, they say, Allah, Allah. That's not our deen, ikhwan. that's khurafat. That's khurafat. We love the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. We honor him, we respect him. That's from our deen. Those who love him the most, will be with him in Al-Jannah. Ya Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, I want to be with you. I ask you for your suhbah, Yawm Al-Qiyamah. The man said, I want to be with you. Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Prophet told the man, Al-Mar'u Ma'man Ahab. The person will be with those who he loves. But the true love is the love that's exemplified in your actions, not just in your kalam, in your actions, not just in your kalam. There is a thing in Arabic that is known as a tamanni a tamanni that's where you just desire something there's a thing in Al-Islam that is known as a mani a mani Allah Ta'ala told this ummah laysa bi a mani yikum wa la a mani ni ahl al-kitab this religion is not based upon your wishful thinking nor is it based upon the wishful thinking of Ahlul Kitab. It's not that. Who's in Jannah? Well, the Sheikh that I love, the saint, he's in Jannah. Your, that wishful thinking of yours doesn't put that man in Jannah. What puts him in Jannah is 
whether or not he was a righteous man. Someone may say, that man is an innovator. Just because it was said, is wishful thinking. That man is on the sunnah. Just because you said, I said it, that sheikh said it, that's wishful thinking. And that's why if you find that an individual has thrown you off of the sunnah, don't worry about that stuff. That's not, that doesn't happen because people said that about you. That's wishful thinking. Never ever stop your journey to pause and to say to people, why are you saying that? Don't say that. Don't say, leave them. And keep the camel moving. Keep the caravan moving. You have a journey to make. So it's not based upon the wishful thinking of the people. Love and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not when a person does the things that we do and then we claim we love him and that's it. You're automatically qualified as a person who is a lover of the Prophet of Al-Islam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Loving him is believing everything that he brought. Loving him is avoiding those things that he made haram. When we make mistakes, we buy into the whole topic of making Tawbah as he taught us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and just trying to pattern our lives to the best of our ability behind the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam and not being of the people who just have a tamanni and a mani. We don't want to be like those individuals. So those are the two issues we want to mention today here clarifying those two points and as I mentioned the khutbah al Jummah we're going to follow up on this and in the statement of Al-Imam Malik about Al-Istiwa we're going to do this some darasatin some darasa some deeper darasa because of the importance of the principle so if you brothers have any questions or comments you can make them now and always remember again so I don't have to keep repeating it if you're sitting in that audience and something is mentioned that was incorrect I say for an example Rasulullah Azza wa Jal you have to say brother you made a mistake Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You have to say, hey, brother, brother, you made a mistake. That's your responsibility. Because even the little brother right here, the sheikh from Kenya, little brother right here, they know, oh, that's a mistake. But he may not say something. When you caught it, you have to right away clarify it. We give you that permission. The dean gives you that permission. If you brothers have any questions, you can put your question for a sheikh Khalid. Sheikh Khalid. Abu Sulaiman. The great scholar that we were mentioning, Al Imam Malik, Rahimullah Ta'ala, as the brothers mentioned about the mihrab that's in the Masjid al Nabawi. Al Imam Malik was the Imam of Dar al Hijra. He was the Imam of Medina. Unlike many of the ulama from Hadith and ulama of his time, he didn't travel at all. Al Imam Malik remained in Medina and people came to him. People came to him. Bukhari, Muslim, and Imam Ahmed traveled all the way to Yemen. Those scholars were all over the place. And Imam, Ma ah, and Imam Malik went nowhere. He's one of the few scholars who stayed in his place and the people came to him. One of his positions in his madhab, his illustrious madhab, is the fact that he was of the opinion that something becomes halal or haram. Something is a hujjah or delil based upon the Quran based upon the sunnah, based upon ijma, based upon the statement of the companion, based upon the actions of the people of al Medina. So he was of the opinion that if the people of al Medina did something, or they're doing something, that's the sunnah, that's from Islam. The scholars rejected that. Some people agree, some people rejected it. And the haq is, it's rejected, because the actions of the people of Medina are not a delil. Allah never told us in the Quran, the sunnah, Look at the actions of the people of Medina. Although, logically, it had its point of view. And Imam Malik wanted to prove his point. So he said to the people, listen, you people, you come from Asham. You come from Khurasan. You over there, you come from Bukhara. You come from Somalia. You come from Azad Kashmir. You come from Lahore. All of you bring me a Sa'a, which is a form of measurement. Bring me a Sa'a. A sa' is when you take a normal man, four handfuls of something, dates, raisins, 
salt, peppers, whatever. That's a sa. He said, you bring me, all of you, bring me this measurement. Because it comes in the sunnah. So many things are mentioned about the sa. You bring me one. So the people brought their sa and they poured it out in front of an Imam Malik. And Imam Malik had the sa, a vessel that was present during the time of the Prophet ﷺ. It was either his or one of his wives. And Imam Malik had it brought and he poured it out. And the size of that was different from the sizes of the other people. He said, this is why I'm of the opinion that the people of Medina, what they do and say is a delil. So logically, you can understand that in that context. But anyway, Al Imam Malik, Rahimullah, everything that he said and everything that the people of Medina said back then is not a delil. So what about the people who came later on? Which is the answer to the brother's question. The Turkish people, Turkey, Turkey, who held the last remnants of the Khilafah of Al Islam, when they were in charge of Mecca and Medina, they let a lot of things happen. And one of the things that they allowed to happen was a lot of innovation and a lot of shik, a lot. They were the ones who built the Kubba, the green dome. That dome cost money. That was a waste of money. It's not from the religion. Why did they bring, build the dome over the prophets? There's a dome like we find when we go to Pakistan and other places, the graveyards. So they put the dome over the prophet's grave, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. They also put the mihrab in the prophet's masjid, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. They also built the large extravagant member and the other elevated place for the mu'addin, making social, social discrimination. The mu'addin should be up here. He's above all other people. No, Bilal radiallahu anhu didn't have a special place to pray in a masjid, nor a special place to make the adhan from. He would make the adhan from above the masjid of the Prophet on the outside. So the point of all of that kalam is because the thing is done in Medina or Mecca, that is not a delil in our deen. Allah Ta'ala commanded in the Quran, اتبعوا ما أنزل إليكم من ربكم ولا تتبعوا من دونه أولياء قليلا ما تذكرون Follow what was revealed to you from your Lord. The Quran and what the Prophet brought Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And don't follow the awliya. Don't follow people just because you believe they're ulama, awliya, this and that and that. Follow what the people say that is correct. So the dome has nothing to do with the deen. The zuhraf of the masjid. One of the signs of the hour is that the people will beautify the masjid. How many of you been to Medina? Can I see your hands? So when you go to Medina, the pillars, especially in the old part of the masjid. You know, people of color, that's why I wear these thobes, green, pink, yellow. Because I'm from Africa, we like those kind of colors. Jamaicans, they like wild colors. People, Latinos, they like Asians, they like wild colors. That's why when you rent their houses, you have these crazy wallpaper schemes. That's how they made the masjid. Where the masjid should just be simple. It should just be simple and easy. So that thing that's going on in that masjid, do we say because in Medina, this is something? Now don't get me wrong, there are things that they do that are very beneficial. They give khidmah to the hujjaj. They make things easy if you want to make hajj. Muslims used to lose their lives there. So there are a lot of things that are going on that are praiseworthy, but everything that happens in Medina and Mecca, that's not the delil for us. Naam, Sheikh, Sheikh. I understand if that means 
if you want to innovate for example the card Islam or the world of Islam, the Sunnah of the Quran, then obviously that, that's bad. But what about the other innovations? Certainly now the issue of the innovation, the authentic hadith that the brother mentioned about the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Allah Yabathu li hadil umma al Ratsi Kulli Mi at the Sena Mengu Jeddi Dulaha Amra Diniha Allah will send a a reviver. Who said that? Allah will send a reviver at the beginning of every 100 years in order to revive the religion for the people. Who's the first reviver? Who knows? The first person who the Radama consider the first mujaddid in Al Islam. Who knows? Take a wild guess. Aywa. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz is considered a mujaddid. Anyway, the brother said that this word of tajdeed or mujaddid it is itself an innovator. It's an innovation itself. So how can the Prophet ﷺ say that there's going to be a reviver and then we have a problem with innovation? I say, no, this is a misunderstanding, a faulty understanding. Because he, Tabarak wa ta'ala, mentioned in the Quran about the Prophet ﷺ that the Prophet said to Quraysh, Ma kuntu bid'am min al-rusul. I am not the bid'ah, I'm not the first messenger who ever came. Although there were many, many messengers who came, I'm not the first one. It's the first fact that there are many, many messengers. He said about himself that he is the badiru samawati wal ard. Allah is the originator of the heavens and the earth. So the bid'ah, which is only one kind in Al Islam, and that is what is evil and what is astray it is the thing that the person is doing in order to get close with Allah by doing something that is not from the religion that's what the innovation is the renewal the, re, the, the what's that word again the revival who comes that's sanctioned by Allah that has been told to us by the Prophet so we can't look at that as being an innovation because the Prophet informed us this thing is going to happen Salatul Duha is not an innovation because he told us this is from the Sunnah and he showed it to us. The innovation is the thing that the person does, he introduces it in the religion, and his niyyat is to get close to Allah by that particular thing. So if it has Dalil for it, and the Prophet called to it, and he did it, and his companions did it, then it's not a, an innovation because he sanctioned it, he allowed it, it was legislated by Allah was legislated on the lisan of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Other than that, what is not sanctioned and people are trying to get close to Allah and it's a religion, then it is a religion. It is an innovation. Men ahdatha fi amrina hadha ma laysa minhu fa huwa rad. Anyone, anyone who introduces something in our religion, it's been introduced by him or her or them, it will be rejected. The other hadith said, Whoever does an action that our religion is not upon that thing, it's not from our religion, it will be rejected. So the innovation, Khwani, is that thing that the people introduce in the religion, there's no delil for it, no proof for it. And he's trying to get close to Allah by that particular thing, it's ibadah, then this thing is the innovation. And there's no such thing as an innovation that is hasana. There's no thing as, such thing as an innovation that is okay because of the fact that every Friday when he would give the khutbah, every khutbah that he would give, when he said the khutbah til haja, he would tell the people, Iyakum wa muhdathatil umur. Finna kulla muhdathatin bid'a. Wa kulla bid'atin dalala wa kulla dalalatin finnar. That's clear in the Arabic language. Beware, you people. In the latter times, not during my time, because anyone who does something, I'm going to correct it. Innovations happen during his time, and he corrected. The lady was trying to get close to Allah by praying in his masjid, and she had a rope. Whenever she got tired, she just hung on to the rope. He said, whose rope is that? 
They said, this is the rope of someone, so Ya Rasulullah. He said, tell her to take it down. Inna Allah la yamillu hatta tamillu. Allah will not become, Allah will not become bored until you become bored. He doesn't want that from you. That companion was standing in the sun, standing up in the sun. They said, who is that? Prophet said, who is that? They said, that's Abu Israel, Ya Rasulullah. What is he doing? They said, he took an oath to stand in the sun and not to speak and to fast all day. The Prophet told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he saw that innovation, doing that to get close to Allah, standing in the sun. I'm not speaking to anyone. Why? Because the Prophet took a long time of not speaking. The Prophet told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, قُولُوا لَهُ and يَسْتَذِلْ وَيَقْعِدْ وَيَتِمُّ صَوْمُهُ وَيَتْكَلَّمْ Tell that man to get in the shade and tell him to sit down and tell him to keep his fast and tell him to talk to the people. So he prevented him from the three things that were not from the religion. Not talking to the people. What happens if the man says, Hachu, Alhamdulillah. I just look at him. So I took an oath. I sneeze. I don't say Alhamdulillah. That's not from our religion. Tell him to talk. Assalamu alaikum. Tell him to sit down. Tell him to get in the shade. But tell him to keep fasting. Because that's, I legislated that. Okay? So the innovation that Hwani do in the time of the Prophet, وسلم, he stopped it. But after his time, after his time, he told the people, beware. Those who live from amongst you for a long time, you're going to see a lot of ikhtilaf. So take my sunnah and the sunnah of the righteous, the khulafa rashidin. Hold on to it with your molas. Have a litisan with the sunnah. Hold on to it with your molas. And beware of the innovations. Beware of those innovations. And another thing about the innovations in Khwani, a lot of things, but one of the main things is every innovation in Al-Islam, it starts as a small thing. All of them, they start off small. And then they grow into something big. That's the nature of the innovation. Every innovation starts off as a pebble. And then it grows into something very big. From the time of the companions and the people in the masjid with the pebbles. Making the dhikr of Allah. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. The man would say, say Allahu Akbar a hundred times. They would count a hundred times. Say, la ilaha a hundred times. Those same people were sitting in the masjid. When Abdullah ibn Mas'ul came and said, hey, what are you people doing? What is this you doing in a, in a circle, circle, circle? And then there's the emir saying, say this a hundred times. And then they would all sit counting the pebbles. He said, you people are on an innovation. Either you are more guided than the companions, because we're not doing this. You're either more guided than we are, or you're on innovation. You're going to be destroyed. They said, oh, Abu Abdurrahman, Abdullah bin Mas'ud. We only want it good. We only want it to get close to Allah by doing what we're doing. He said, how many people want good, but they don't hit the good. They have the near, but they don't get the good. The narrator of the hadith said, on the day when Ali ibn Abi Talib as the Khalifa was fighting against the Khawarij, he said it was those people who were in that masjid, in that majlis, they were the ones who were fighting us with their swords. So it started off as a pebble, and it turned into a sword, and it turned into them saying, Ali is a kafir. The companions are kuffar. We're going to kill them. Aisha, we can take her as one of the ladies and do with her what you do with the lady from the spoils of war. Every innovation is like that. Hey, let's come together and let's just take this day as the day where we're going to do the Mawlid the Nebawi. All we're going to do is just say, remember the Prophet, that's all. We're just going to remember. Everybody put your hand up and make dua. It starts off like that. Next thing it turns into what they do in Tunis. On the 12th of the Rabia Thani, lights all over the place in the street, sweets, dates, party, what they do in Pakistan, what they do here in Birmingham. On my street, they have like the Christmas lights all in front of the house. The whole thing, like when people get married. People know what I'm talking about, right? You raise up the telephone bill, the electric bill, because the whole thing, and some of it, I have to say, is, looks nice, but it reminds me of Christmas. Every innovation starts off like that. So, Ikhwani, as we mentioned yesterday, the blueprint is what the companions were upon, radiallahu anhum. Let's be satisfied with where they stopped. 
Stop where they stopped. Stop where they stopped. Go forward where they go where they went forward. Any more questions, Ikhwani Fillah? Abu Umar Al Albani. Yes, to do the adhan outside is the sunnah and it's better to do it inside is what they call tahsil al-hasil. Tahsil al-hasil. The purpose of the adhan is to call the creation to the religion. So when the mu'adhan makes the adhan, everything that hears is called rocks, birds, trees, ants, insects, Every animal, every human being, Muslim, non-Muslim, angels, everyone who hears the call of the Mu'adhan will be a witness for him, Yawm Al-Qiyam. If the people only knew the reward of the Adhan, if they only knew the reward of being the Mu'adhan, and there was no way to determine who the Mu'adhan is going to be except by drawing lots, then they will say, okay, we're going to draw lots. So you can come to this masjid and you can go to the ministration and say, that brother who gives you that, why can't I be the mu'adhan? I want to be the mu'adhan. What's the, what's the protocol? If you knew it was in the adhan. So try to be the mu'adhan. So if you make the adhan inside, it's just being heard by the people who are inside. But we have to make the adhan inside due to the country that we live in, due to the circumstances. They have noise pollution. They have all kinds of laws that are going on. This is a listed building, a historical landmark. We don't, they already asked us dispatches and everything like that. We're going to add on to the problem. So that's why it's being done on the inside. But it shouldn't be done right here, as the ulama of al-Hadid said. To make the adhan at the minbar is from the innovations that the ulama of the past made the tansis of it. And this is not an issue khwani, of people being tough and rough and closed, but in the ibadat of al-Islam, in order not to be like Ahl al-Kitab, the scholars were very careful about these issues. If we're just let it flow, do whatever, if we're like that, then our religion is going to become like the religion of Ahl al-Kitab. Like we mentioned again, the swirling dervishes, you people saw them before, with the dress, and goes around in Turkey and other than Turkey. We're not against Turkey. We only want anybody here to think we're against the Atrak. But if you ever saw that, how they do that, that's ibadah to some of the people. That's ibadah. That has nothing to do with anything. I saw with my own eyes when I was in Sudan a few years ago, a man ran and he flipped over into a circle, a ball, and he rolled down the street very fast as a ball. And they said he was from the Oliya of Allah. <laughs> Zeki, I'm not, Zeki. I'm not against you, man. But I, I saw it with my own eyes. I said, wow, I couldn't believe it. And he was going fast for a long time. I said, wow, that was a Delil. He was from the Oliya of Allah, and that was a form of ibadah. So the point is, stick to where the companion stuck. As an Imam al-Shafi'i said, when someone mentioned, I don't remember how it went, some scholars said, if you see a man flying in the air, then don't believe that he's a wali from the awliya of Allah. Just because he's flying in the air. They said that in the presence of an Imam al-Shafi'i, he said, look, that's not enough. If you see him flying in the air, and walking on the water, on top of the water. He goes out into the water and he's walking. Don't believe he's from the Oli of Allah until you take all of his actions and statements and you superimpose it upon the Quran and the Sunnah. He's walking on water and he's flying in the air, but he doesn't pray. He's walking on water and he's flying in the air and he slaughters for other than Allah. He's walking on water and he's flying in the air and he's opposed to the Sunnah. He's not from the awliya of Allah. It's trickery. It's from shaitan. It's from the dajjal. Something is going on. Allahu Akbar. Last question, our brother right here. Ah, Nasir. Nasir.
the head is in the box. And everybody was giving 20 pounds, 50 pounds, just looking at this, you know, this head. Where, where did they get this hair from? I don't believe that the hair of the Prophet وسلم, still anyone has any remnants of the hair of the Prophet وسلم, if there was really his hair if this was real if it was real then I wouldn't have any problem with getting barakah from his hair if it was really real because the Prophet's companions وسلم, ajmain, they used to make a tabarruk from him they used to make a tabarruk from the water from his wudu, they would try to be keen and they would struggle with each other to get the water. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. His sweat, they used to take the barakah from his sweat. So if in fact there was a hair, we know this was the cloth of the Messenger of Allah. When he died or his daughter died, Zainab, he took some of his clothing, a cloth, and he said, Here, bury this with her. Barakah. Barakah. There's nothing wrong with that. But we have to establish, is that really his clothes? If it's really his clothes, we love him. That's something close. That's something that's close to his clothes. That's something that was close to his person. But we won't miss the salat for something like that to get in line. We won't pay money for something like that. We won't go overboard and think that thing can get you into the Jannah. But we know that the companions did at tabarruk from his stuff, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but it was within boundaries, it was within the degrees. Maybe we can come with some of the uh, conditions that this thing can be done. But there's no hair of the Prophet remaining, his clothes are not remaining, his sandals are not remaining, his staff is not remaining, so we should avoid believing in these issues. As for his grave, and touching the partition that's been put up, there's no barakah from that. Those partitions were put up many years later, centuries after his death, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, to prevent the people from doing, desecrating his grave. Desecrating his grave. And Allah is a'la and a'lam. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hey, Zeki, have you seen the Sheikh Dawood? He called me on the telephone. SubhanAllah, he left a message. I didn't talk to him. It was hard to understand what he was saying, but he was trying to talk. It was an indication that he's... Yeah, yeah. I haven't been in a, since we went. It's the last time I went.